Welcome to the first episode of Photography Exposed. I'm Ryan Palmer. And I'm Christina Izzo. And this podcast is going to cover a lot of discussions, interviews with photographers, and it's going to have tips and tricks, gear reviews, a lot of things that uh, we think photographers are going to like to see. So we're not going to stick to one specific kind of format. Some of these will be video, some will be uh, audio, and some will probably be screencasts as well. Whatever format seems to work best for whatever the material we're covering for that episode. So the first thing we want to talk about uh, for the podcast today is we actually had on campus here at Washington College, uh, Mitch Epstein came and, uh, th- and discussed his new book, American Power, which uh, is a book, it's a photo book about uh, all the uh, images that he shot in the course of traveling all over the country and uh, taking pictures of uh, power plants and uh, nuclear and coal and wind farms and solar and all the different things uh, that kind of conveyed the, the idea of American power. And he chose to do it in a large, with a large format camera, um, which kind of aided to the whole, you know, big scheme kind of yeah. power plants. Yeah, I think he used the, uh, the term yes. supersize me kind of the, in the description of how he wanted to, do, to be able to, to be able to, for his actual gallery display, these were, you know, very large prints and to be able to have these large prints and still be able to see the minute detail when you blow them up, you know, something that... Um, he was looking to the medium for, and large format cameras to do that. I think he was shooting with 4x5s four by four, four by and 8x10s. Yeah. So. Six years ago, an editor at the New York Times Magazine called me to tell me about a photographer who had just shot some pictures in a town called Cheshire, Ohio. And he wanted me to write a short essay for the magazine to go along with some of these pictures. And when I protested to him that I had never been to Cheshire, Ohio, In fact, I had barely even heard of Cheshire, Ohio, until just a few moments before. Um, He said it didn't matter, that the pictures were exceptional, and that the story they told was so vivid that I wouldn't even need to go. And when these pictures popped up a few hours later in my email inbox after I'd agreed to the assignment, I discovered that my editor was absolutely right about these amazing photographs. And that was when I first discovered Mitch Epstein um, and the project that would grow into the book American Power. Um, Fast forward um, almost six years from that conversation, that assignment, to last July when I got a call from that same editor of the New York Times asking me to do another short essay based on Mitch's photographs. And this time, the project that I'd seen at its original conception, I guess in some ways even before its conception, was complete, and Mitch's book was about to roll off the presses. Um, And as you're about to see, or maybe as some of you um, have seen already, if you've looked at the book or bought the book, it's a remarkable work, indeed a remarkable work of art. Like much of Mitch's work over the past several decades, American Power takes the reader, or possibly I should say the viewer, on a kind of exploring expedition deep into a country both familiar and unfamiliar. I say familiar because the country is America, and many of the landscapes that Mitch Mitch portrays are ones that might seem perfectly ordinary to you or me if we just happen to walk or drive past them. But I say also unfamiliar because Mitch's eye and Mitch's lens lets us experience those places in startlingly new ways, as I think you will see. Mitch's books are photo essays in the truest sense. There's almost no text, but through the images themselves, meticulously selected and ordered, stories and insights and ideas, I might even say arguments, unfold. In fact, it's kind of ironic that through looking at Mitch's pictures and reading Mitch's books, looking at Mitch's books, Um, it's proved to me that they don't really need any words at all, including mine, or especially mine. (laughs) So I won't give you many more words now, just um, a few highlights from Mitch's impressive um, resume uh, career. His seven books include, I I think their titles will give you a sense of how broad-ranging his his imagination um, and how wide an angle he's he's seen the world through. Um, His books include... Recreation, Family Business, The City, and Vietnam. He's also worked as a director, a cinematographer, and a production designer on several films, including Salam Bombay and Mississippi Masala. And he's received a 
Guggenheim Fellowship and the Berlin Prize in Arts and Letters, among other awards and honors. His photographs are in many of the most important museums in America and indeed in the world, including the Metropolitan Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Whitney Museum in New York, as well as the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And now I am very pleased to welcome him to Washington College, which is in Chestertown. <laughs> All right, I should, uh, I should just mention that um, we're going to, Mitch is going to speak for a while about the images, show you some pictures, talk to you, and then he and I are going to sit down and sort of start a conversation off about his work that then we hope that you guys will all join in. Thank you, Adam, and thank you all for coming here tonight. Should, um, should we dim the, are we going to dim the lights a bit or? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's my meeting Adam and getting even to this point um, of being invited here tonight um, in a way I think speaks a lot to um, how my work takes shape. Um, I had the, um, the good fortune, if you will, uh, to be asked to do a commission about um, this small town of Cheshire, Ohio. Um, and it was the, um, the personal experience that I had in Cheshire that stayed with me. Um, um, and, you know, as a photographer, um, when my work is published in magazines, I'm often um, nervous when I'm told that a text is going to be added as a as a kind of compliment to the um, to the piece. And um, it was uh, a tremendous um, delight to, um, to 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 read Adam's text, which was erudite and um, in some ways as intimate. Um, with this place that I had myself spent a couple weeks in. So in fact, he didn't go, but in a literary way, found this possibility of putting himself in that place, partly through the study of my pictures, but partly through um, the study of a small American town. Um, I had no idea at the time that the experience of going to Cheshire would stay with me. Um, and you'll see now as I um, work my way through this series of pictures, why it stayed with me and what it instigated. Um, so the body of work, American Power, examines the use and misuse of energy in our culture and the relationship between American society and the American landscape. As I show these images, I'll talk to you about why I made this project, how I went about it, and how it ultimately affected me as an artist. This picture, and these pictures, just so you have some understanding of what it is that I did that led to this moment of publishing a book and being here tonight. Um, I've been photographing for 35 years, and I, my beginnings were working with a hand camera. Um, but when I got to this point um, around the year um, 2003, when I went to Cheshire, I had begun to work with a large format camera, which is a much more 19th century way of working. As you all know and have grown up, you're part of this digital era. So I shoot film, um, and I process my film, and I make uh, prints, and in this case, because I was dealing with a subject that was about this whole notion of supersize me that we have live through uh, in a cultural sense. I wanted to make pictures um, that would be big. Um, big in terms of their physical sense, how they would hold the wall, but big also in terms of uh, their layering, their scope. So here I am, um, about a year after Cheshire, um, at uh, a site in West Virginia, looking at the Amos Coal power plant. This was one of the um, first key pictures. Here, another image um, also um, in that vicinity. And midway through the work, as I was developing it, I realized um, that this whole notion of power, because I started, you know, I left Cheshire and I came away very unnerved um, 
by what the consequences in this little community um, that had been shut down um, um, and in a way bought out um, by American electric power because of the um, contaminants that had been spewed from the plant, um, how complicated the relationship was um, between um, community and corporations. Um, and what was this whole notion of power? I realized that power was like a Russian nesting doll. Each time I uncovered one kind of power, I found another kind within. I opened up electrical power and discovered political power inside. I opened up political power and encountered corporate power. Within corporate was consumer. Within consumer was civic. Inside civic was religious, and so on. One type of power hiding inside another. And it was the, this interconnectedness um, of all of these contributing uh, and interconnected uh, ways that our society were functioning around the subject of energy that drew my interest in. So as I went and looked at power plants, at sites where energy was produced, um, I, I began to look beyond those sites, partly because I was often steered away um, from being able to photograph at these sites because of security concerns. I began also by making these pictures with the idea that an artist lives outside the nesting doll and can simply open and examine it. Now I see it differently. Artists sit outside it, but also within, exerting their own power. The power of art very often derives from its willingness to examine the implications of power in all senses of the word. At this nuclear power plant, for instance, where's that handy pointer that, oh, here it is. You just push this thing here. So take notice, this and this, these are what they call bullet, bulletproof gun turrets um, that have been installed at all US nuclear power plants post 9-11. Here we're looking at a power plant um, called Vodal which is in Georgia. For those of you who are keeping up with this whole topic of energy, uh, um, President Obama just recently signed off on um, um, supporting a new nuclear power plant here at this site in Georgia. So as you know, in 2003, I was asked to photograph Cheshire, Ohio. Nearly all the residents of Cheshire had been paid off by the American Electric Power Company to leave town and never come back. After they left, their homes were demolished. This deal was made to avoid future lawsuits over environmental contamination. I saw how people lived in the shadow of a polluting plant, and I photographed many of the abandoned homes of those who'd sold out. I began to think about how we depend on energy without considering its direct consequences on our lives. And I made pictures like this that are not simply an illustration of that. Um, they draw from my larger experience um, as a photographer who's interested in making pictures who don't require the artist to be standing next to them um, in an expository way telling you about what it is that you should be looking at. Um, I make pictures that need to, um, to find their rightness um, and to hold a kind of mystery um, that photography can bring uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, the way in which I perceive um, and then hopefully can share with you to perceive um, things that are drawn from the real world. Um, and so, you know, in a case like this, too, the, it's, the, it's the rendering, it's the, uh, it's, the very, it's, the, it's the very quality of how something that is quite horrific, because this is containing, you know, carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxide and mercury, um, can also, in a pictorial way, be quite beautiful. And so there's this strangeness between this meeting 
um, of beauty and terror that's difficult, um, but also what it is. Here again, um, I'm in Cheshire, um, photographing a newspaper page that was taped on the wall in a pizza shop. The owner had written gone across the image of a house that was scheduled for demolition. And so where the pictures come from are, in a further way, mysterious. This is, you're looking here now at something very enlarged. It's just a small piece of another picture, but I was moved by um, the handwriting on the picture that made it in, and gave me a kind of opportunity to look into a picture and to see it, you know, again, with all its aberrations, um, as something else other than what it had been attended as an illustration um, in the Columbus newspaper. This is Beulah Hearn. She was a holdout in Cheshire. Her friends called her Boots. Boots refused to sell her home. Having been harassed by American electric power, she had taken her security in hand by installing two surveillance cameras at her window. Boots watched me as I photographed her video cameras and monitors. She asked, would you like to see my gun? And from the other side, uh, from, and from the side pouch of her easy chair, where I expected to see the farmer's almanac, she pulled out a handgun and respectfully unloaded it. Here I was in the home of a genteel elderly woman, my idea of a sweet grandma. Only she was armed in self-defense. I was unnerved by the measures she had taken to protect herself. Boots' security mirrored the security at the coal plant. Surveillance was everywhere in the tiny town of Cheshire. And it was Boots that I couldn't forget about. It was Boots that I just could not get out of my head when I got back to you know, the fast-paced, cacophonous environment of New York where I live and work um, because it just didn't make sense to me that somebody who was 80 years old who had lived in this place was ending up in this situation. Um, Here we are again inside another nuclear power plant. Uh, this woman is, this young, very young woman is a guard. This is what guards look like at nu nuclear power plants. So my question in part is, how far will we go as a society to keep in place, to protect what we already have, have achieved? And making pictures like this the way in which I was doing it, they're very, I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's a whole other gambit when you're working with a four by five camera. You, you know, you're looking at an image reflected through a lens on a ground glass, you're seeing it upside down. I'm not lighting this picture, I'm just using the light. I'm, ask, I'm asking this woman, and, this, and here even the focus I think is a little bit challenging, but she's holding there for a second. I'm, I'm kind of working with the ambience of these environments as they are. Um, out of a position of respect, but also uh, knowing that I can command in the way in which I'm perceiving them uh, a kind of uh, photographic opportunity, if you will. Here I'm inside an office of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission at the Grand Gulf plant in Mississippi. I suppose you can all read it, but it's, it's the George Orwell quote. Um, that's typed across the frame photograph um, that depicts a nuclear accident, which says, to see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. I have to say I found that quite ironic in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's office uh, um, in this plant. Here, this image is made at Signal Hill, Long Beach. Those of some of you may know the Upton Sinclair um, um, portrait of oil in Southern California, um, um, or may have seen the film with Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, Let There Be Blood, the protagonist. Uh, this was once a hillside that was just a place where oil gushed. It was just 
unstoppable. Now what you see uh, is uh, this uh, residential kind of uh, um, sprawl where you just have, you know, an empty space or two. When will this, you know, when will this um, last open space be filled? This is a, a picture of a place uh, called Wyadak, a coal mine uh, up in northeastern Wyoming. I had just been to the Democratic Convention in the summer of 2008, which was sponsored by the so-called clean coal industry. Um, on my way to drive out to St. Paul to the Republican Convention, because by that time in my project, I realized how central politics was to the subject of energy in our country. I stopped here in, in Gillette, um, uh, where I photographed this open pit coal mine. It was probably about the 40th or 50th um, coal mine um, that I had approached to gain access to. This was the first one and the only one in the course of this five-year project where I was able to, uh, to get this vantage. Uh, and that is very difficult for somebody who's not simply looking to make, make an illustration, you know, that's going to just um, be just uh, a quick picture. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a real gymnastic when you're thrown into a situation and you're given a limited time and trying to find a right vantage, but also um, one that's expansive. Um, and one that doesn't necessarily give answers, but asks questions. As a means um, to get going in the morning, to tell you something about how I work, I design an itinerary for myself. But having a clear plan is a ruse to launch me into the world and into the work. Much of the time, my best pictures come from going someplace I hadn't planned. The point is to set myself up to be surprised. I went to Oregon, for instance, to photograph the Army Corps of Engineer hydroelectric dams along the Columbia River. After spending a day photographing the Dolls Dam, which you see here, I went into town to look around. I found this car lot with a mural depicting a Christian missionary preaching to American Indians. There was an abundance of meaning there, the power of a car's gasoline, but also the power of the white man to overtake the natives, and by extension, nature, which the American Indians in general have a tradition of treating with greater respect than the white man. Here again, religion shows up in the form of a baptism, along with a defunct nuclear power plant in Northern California. Fort Pierce, Florida is only miles away from a nuclear power plant. In 2004, the town was pummeled by Hurricanes Francis and Jean. A dredging barge was brought in to restore the beaches. So the way in which I worked was I would go to here to this to see the nuclear power plant, but it was almost impossible to photograph a nuclear power plant because our government doesn't allow photographers to photograph nuclear power plants. Um, so as you saw with the Dolls Dam here, I started to look around and to then see and think about um, the landscape that was in the environs of the plant. And to the, again, to the extent that we will go to sustain and maintain uh, uh, lands a, a, an attitude toward landscape, uh, which uh, uh, has long been in place, but uh, um, that is now, um, in some ways, as we have experienced these kind of extreme 
uh, deadly weather, you know, with hurricanes, you know, Katrina and here Jean Francis and Rita and and other things. That's 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 that, in my view, is um, asking questions about what our relationship is um, to the to, to to this landscape that we've often taken f um, for granted. And I wanted to, as well, as I looked at energy sites, um, to think about consumption. Um, so going to Las Vegas to photograph the Hoover Dam and Yucca Mountain, it made sense to look at Las Vegas. Uh, um, but to do it also in a way that, um, uh, that was not simply about the seduction but about the sprawl as well, about what it takes to sustain an environment like Las Vegas. So. So when you look, you know, at the print, you know, you step up to it. And I guess that's sort of the difference in a way between what we what I do here when I share my work is um, I want the viewer to engage with the detail. And so here I'm working with an 8x10 camera. So it's four times the size of a 4x5. Uh, and so when you look up, you can see the density. Uh, you can see the time of day it is because you see the, uh, the kind of uh, traffic jam, uh, the bottleneck, if, if you will. Um, So Yucca Mountain, the US government has spent over $13 billion on building a tunnel at Yucca Mountain, only about 100 miles north from Las Vegas, with the hope that one day nuclear waste will, or would one day be stored underground here in perpetuity. Last spring, President Obama cut funding for the project. Roads are still our priority. When I look at this, I'm reminded of the Orson Welles film, The Magnificent Ambersons, where cars are blamed for the downfall of society. It's the most wonderful film for those of you who haven't seen it. And it, um, in some way, it's, it is about um, the richness of um, small historical Mid, in this case, a Midwestern American town um, that is just at that moment where the automobile comes in and wreaks havoc to the life of the town. So there's, there is a kind of kinship maybe even between this small, your small town here of Chestertown and that mythic um, town that Or's Orson Welles shaped. Um, see ya. This is how old I am. I'm not even real. I, I was wondering, I'm, why am I having such a hard time to read? Because I, don't, I didn't have my right glasses on here. <laughs> um, so I, what I did was I decided to shoot this project um, in a series of trips. Uh, in my studio, I had a map of the US, which I stuck with color-coded pushpins. Blue for coal, red for nuclear, green for wind, and yellow for bin there and so on. My studio manager, Ryan, and I would plot my next trip while staring at the map, feeling a bit like generals making strategy for battle. Before I could leave, dozens of queries went out to corporate public relations, plant managers, government bureaus, people living off the grid, or stewing up biodiesel, <coughs> congressional aides, and cheap motels. But as I've said already, many of my favorite pictures were the result of serendipity, like this picture, which I, dis which I found by accident. <coughs> the next few photographs were all made on the Gulf Coast following Hurricane Katrina. By that time, scientists had connected the dots between burning fossil fuels, climate change, and, ex change and extreme deadly weather. Katrina symbolizes the consequences of our harmful energy policies and energy guzzling super me culture. This picture was made on Dauphine Island, Alabama, where a battered oil platform washed ashore.
And this work was made in Biloxi, Mississippi. And in the actual print, it also it, it conjures some of that same meeting that I spoke about with the smoke picture, where there is this uncomfortable tension um, between the horror of these um, of the aftermath of Katrina, of the detritus, this personalized detritus of this mattress impaled um, on a pointed limb of the tree and blankets hanging, looking almost like it's a landscape out of, you know, uh, Goya's disasters of war. Um, and this moment in time, which uh, is what the, which, which creates this kind of veneer of the picture, which is this time of day when the sun on the gulf is just on the verge of the, you know, of, 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 of setting and falling below the higher horizon. So it's got this kind of warm glow um, where nature is just doing its thing. It's on its own course. It's not, it's, it's forgotten what happened six weeks earlier. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is to employ at times these opposites um, and to create this kind of bittersweet um, um, meeting um, of extremes. And here, photographing an oil heiress um, who's lost in past Christian um, um, her ancestral family home, um, um, using the um, um, the remnants of a porch uh, where her family's life gardener has collected um, um, all of these kind of personal objects, mementos, as a kind of a, a proscenium, uh, in in a sense. Uh, um, and, you know, making pictures that speak in a more metaphoric way um, to um, aspects of, um, of, of my theme. Um, here, there was a kind of a wonderful backstory where this woman who was a woman of great privilege um, came back uh, because she was um, one of obviously concerned for her home um, and ancestral place, but also because she wanted to be present and to in some way serve her community. Um, and she brought a wonderful New York architect who was building a building that was commissioned for Tulane, took him off the building at Tulane University and built a community center um, that uh, has nothing per se to do with this picture, but in some way um, it speaks about character and about the idea of um, in an imaginative way, what can American power be? And that, for me, having lived through this experience of making this work, um, and also having spent a lot of time in Europe um, in this period, um, has been meaningful to think about how um, we have lived through um, a period where the term American power can conjure as quickly a negative association as a positive one. And what are the stories and what are the opportunities to begin for that to, um, to, 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 to turn in another direction? National Guard sleeping in New Orleans. After Katrina, the art insurance company, AXA, flew in a team of New York City policemen to secure the museum. The weirdness of, you know, if you look closely, you've got like the accoutrements of this man's job. You know, you've got a whole tin of these like uh, Austrian butter cookies or something, you know, uh, <laughs> a metal detector, uh, uh, a gun, uh, uh, examination gloves. I mean, these are details you, you don't see because of the dumbing down of digital. Uh, you know, when you look into the pr actual print, you know, you, you have the reflection of the, um, of the windows behind the 
for me conjures up um, those scenes in North in the Hitch Hitchcock film North by Northwest. So again, there's this you know there there are these kind of extremes. The idea of this New York City policeman that's my town. I you know I I do appreciate these guys, but you know that are getting paid you know a hundred and some odd bucks to come down there and to you know the, the art gets protected because it's insured. So this project, in a way, was for me a kind of chronicle of the Bush-Cheney era, with its rapacious environmental policies and partnerships with big oil and corporate coal. These pictures have an underlying current of the constant anxiety I felt photographing in a country on high alert. George W. Bush, in my opinion, engendered paranoia and jacked up homeland security, which meant I was stopped and interrogated many times. I don't think this requires any explanation. Uh, all, I don't know, with my reading glasses, I can't read it, but the, uh, I'll have to go a little closer. Uh, but it's. It's almost unreadable, and I should just know it right off the top of my head, but it's a wonderful kind of graphic. Uh, uh, you know, it basically tells you how uh, buying oil uh, outside the United States uh, will lead to terrorist activity. Uh, now, I guess there are, you know, this is in war at Buffett's town. This isn't from Omaha, Nebraska. I guess there, there still is some oil that is um, virginal American um, for those that feel the the compulsion to, 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 to buy it that way. The worst of my confrontations, as I made reference to with the law, occurred in West Virginia in 2004. I was stopped by a sheriff for standing on public land and pointing my camera at a coal stack a half a mile away. It wasn't while I was making this picture, I'll let you know. She made an impression getting out of her SUV in a red halter top and pressed black pants, and across her chest, a double-sided leather holster equipped with two handguns and a string of bullets. My first thought was how to convince this contemporary Annie Oakley to let me make her portrait. I restrained myself. <laughs> but my cooperation did not stop her from calling in reinforcements, including the FBI, for a more comprehensive interrogation. During nearly two hours of questioning by six law enforcement officials, I was told, you can't just go pointing your camera at these infrastructures anymore. And if you were Muslim, you'd be cuffed and taken in for questioning. When it was over, I was angry. I took for granted my freedom to photograph in public places in the United States. It was my constitutional right. But now cops and the FBI threw me out of town more than once and inspected my pictures. My anger became fuel. I wanted to make pictures that would express the tension and fear I felt from contending with Homeland Security. Ironically, on my second trip to West, to West Virginia, when I made this picture at the Amos Coal Power Plant, which you saw in the first couple of pictures, the high school football players and the residential hamlet with the cooling towers, the public relations officer there greeted me warmly. I didn't understand. No one in the coal industry had welcomed me. It turned out, to my delight, he owned a copy of my book, Recreation, and asked me to sign it. <laughs> this was uh, photographed in uh, West, Tex West Texas, looking at a former gas station uh, that's now become a bric-a-brac shop. In the style of 19th century painting and photography of the American West, 
This picture of the Hoover Dam is a rendering of nature's awesomeness. But look closer, and you can see the diminishing water line, the so-called bathtub ring. The ring is a result of a more than 10-year drought, as well as the siphoning off of water to nearby Las Vegas for luxury hotels and golf courses. Water itself has become more valuable than the electricity it can produce. The dramatic view <coughs> gives way to human scale details. And when you look at the actual print, you see highway lights, cars, there are people in just this relaxed repose on the, on the, 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 the dam road, and clocks that also humanize it, that read two different times. Because you have the split of the two time zones, um, Nevada on the west and Arizona on the east. Um, and so it's again, it's these, it's these details, these punctuating details that bring a kind of human um, um, tenor, a kind of character uh, uh, that are very integral to the read of the whole picture, which are not seeable from you know, your perspective here, unfortunately. So in the same way that I, in the aftermath of Katrina um, and other hurricanes, reflected on the relationship between nature and energy, um, I traveled to Alaska to, to follow the path of the Alaskan pipeline. Um, and then in the course of that also went and looked at glaciers, receding glaciers in, 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 in one of our national parks in Alaska. So that's what you see here. Um, um, somehow, for me, it was this whole quality of the way this kind of volcanic, this, this earth and uh, landscape ends up meeting this thing of great beauty, this ir you know, kind of irradiant blue light that comes out of this uh, uh, glacier. Uh, um, and it almost feels like it's melting into a parking lot. It's very, very strange. Uh, Uh, this is the Shel uh, Chevron oil refinery um, in Point Richmond, California. Um, here I'm photographing a eucalyptus tree, um, just like the refinery, not indigenous to this landscape. So a another layer of complication, um, if you will. Uh, um, also the meeting of two microclimates, you know, the, you have all that fog. Um, that's kind of obscuring, but also rendering in a very painterly-like way um, the refinery in the distance. Um, you know, all the oil, um, uh, whatever you call them, vessels out there on the hill. And, and then here's kind of soft sunlight coming from the east. This is Oildale. After I forget the protagonist's name, you know, and the, the, the who will uh, let there be blood. I mean, after he took over Signal Hill in the movie, they go up, he goes up, and that's the next sort of uh, uh, landscape to conquer. So here you see, you know, you're looking way out in you know, all these directions. When you're looking at the actual print, you can see pump jacks, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, you know, many of them still. Uh, but basically, you know, a very spent, exhausted landscape. So again, in the same character of the Las Vegas picture, I'm looking here, photographing inside uh, what's claimed to be the world's largest truck stop on Interstate 80 in Iowa. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, looking at, you know, where we, you know, have given ourselves the options to look at, if we need a taillight, well, we can choose from a hundred, you know, and uh, um, I don't know, it looks like 
truck driving looks like a really happy experience, and I'm thinking I'm missing something here. <laughs> Or here I'm photographing a, um, um, a port terminal in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, so again, giving myself this kind of license to connect the dots between things that in my view are interconnected and also will enable me to make pictures that relate to each other, but often um, um, in ways that are tangential. A wind farm, in, another wind farm in Texas. One of the things that you know struck me uh, uh, about wind farms is how, um, in the course of doing this project, um, um, there's been so much discussion about how aesthetically um, compromised wind farms are to the landscape. And here, um, well, one, there, there, there's this beautiful kind of. Uh, multi-level use of this landscape because this is all grazing land and so you have cows that are taking advantage of it. Um, but here there are really these kind of extraordinary sentinels. I mean part of it is, uh, uh, is uh, anointed by this kind of beautiful fog light with the sun you know, kind of backlit. But it, um, they become these kind of mystical, very majestical, uh, uh, very statuary uh, structures to, 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 to my eye. And here we're, um, I'm photographing in um, St. Bernard Parish. Some of you know that's right next to the Lower Ninth Ward uh, where the Katrina wreaked some of its worst havoc. Um, looking at the Shellmet oil refinery, um, the stand of oaks once led to a plantation house they now lead to an Exxon Mobil refinery. The trees serve as attendants, timeless. They function beyond the temporality of our interventions. They have a gothic, ominous quality to them that suggests they will eventually take over. And here, uh, a picture made at the Altamont Pass um, in Northern California, one of the first areas where um, wind farming uh, was established in this country. A coal mine in North Dakota. This is um, Palm Springs. So my work questions all kinds of energy. This photograph of a burnt out turbine suggests that no perfect easy solution exists. When I was making this picture, I, I wasn't sure what it meant. And I'm still not. The burnt turbine in a sea of functioning turbines simply struck me. So I photographed it. I was driving from Las Vegas to the Navajo power plant in Page, Arizona, and I came upon a tow truck operator in the middle of Lake Mead National Park in Nevada. He was there to tow a car that had been taken out on a joyride, torched and left on the edge of a cliff. father and son, motocross bikers um, near Midland, Texas. I never gained access to the Democratic Convention and neither did I get into the Excel Energy Center in St. Paul during the Republican Convention. I had tried hard for each with excellent connections but I was not a journalist who would promote the events in the news, which made me unnecessary and potentially risky. I realized at some point that this project was in part about not getting in. What I saw on the outside though was less predictable and more intriguing to me than the hoopla inside the halls. I made a picture of the Fox News electronic billboard here, sitting outside the Republican 
convention, for example, which was tracking the approach of Hurricane Gustav. Gustav halted the proceedings for a day and brought back horrible and for many politicians embarrassing memories of their response to Katrina. Here is a s solar energy array, small one, on the grounds of the Pentagon, the behemoth on the hill. It is very good to see the military looking into solar. And this picture was uh, of, this n of a nuclear warhead um, I made at the Department of Energy in Washington on the mall. Security wouldn't let me photograph the department's solar installation because it was near an air conditioning duct. They didn't think a duct should go out, a photograph of a duct should go out into the world. But I was free to photograph this. It never occurred to the Department of Energy to be embarrassed by its celebration of a nuclear missile. And here's the picture that I was most um, excited about um, of the Alaska pipeline. So you're looking at some of the Alaska range, um, not the highest peaks, but you see um, the pipe as it's penetrating the earth. And this is one of the pictures for me that calls into question what, what precisely we use electricity for. One of the strangest, most optimistic pictures here shows blue-white threads of electricity. As vivid as Zeus's thunderbolt, a young man, more like a DJ than an inventor, spins electricity from a Tesla coil, coil he built in him, I see the grassroots ingenuity that has historically improved American lives. And it's not that we're going to get out of our fix with Tesla coils. It's about the spirit of um, somebody really just for its own sake wanting to make something that's, uh, uh, that will lead to something else. And that is meaningful to, my, to, to, to me. This picture, again, is another one that's very hinged in on the detail. When you look closely um, and you take note of the fact that these two gentlemen are African-American, um, quite well-dressed, in fact, uh, um, and these two are Caucasian, um, and that they're in some kind of, you know, utterly inexplicable moment of symmetry, like chess pieces, one <coughs> set facing the other, um, but in this kind of reverential, almost Japanese kind of bow to each other. Um, in the year of um, Obama, President Obama being elected, it was um, kind of a strange um, moment. Iron workers um, that I photographed at a, another decommissioned nuclear power plant, this, in this case a commercial one um, that was on the site of the Hanford Reservation in um, uh, southeastern Washington where we developed the atomic bomb and have consequently had one of the biggest super fund um, clean, cleanups of atomic waste uh, in all history. And a picture from Niagara Falls. I guess there's sexual power, too. I have to give myself, as an artist, all kinds of license, you know? And here, I'm looking at, um, from above, from the vantage of a um, grain elevator. 
a quite classic small American farming town in Iowa um, where the eye leads out uh, into an expanse of turbines um, that sit in a, you know, a landscape of, coal, uh, of corn and um, soy soybean farming, not oil wells or coal stacks uh, um, dotting the horizon. So when I started this work, I was wary of the obvious political implications of my subject matter. When I set out to photograph, I don't consciously think about politics. Artists who let polit their politics overcome them become propagandists, which I strictly wanted to avoid. But the grim political reality of the US between 2003 and 2008 would somehow have to find its way into this body of work. I could not ignore the security excesses, corporate avarice, and environmental indifference I encountered. Photographs at their best, though, are not about politics or any one thing. They are about many things at once that can be read in infinite ways. And so I noticed, Adam, that you caught yourself when you said the word red, I think, when it came to pictures. And I do think pictures do require reading in the way that language and text requires reading. Um, um, and so um, we, we, we take so much for granted um, um, because we're so inundated with photography. But it's pictures, um, it's for me um, that they communicate in the end the mysteries of human experience that are ineffable, um, yet still need to be shared. So thank you so much for hearing me out today. Appreciate it. Thank you. This concludes the first episode of Photography Exposed. Be sure to join our Facebook group where you can submit questions and be eligible to win Mitch Epstein's book, American Power. Which he was nice enough to sign uh, for us to have to give to one of our listeners. We're going to be uh, giving it away in a few weeks. We're going to give a few weeks to have enough time for everybody who's uh, you know just getting started with following this podcast to join up, join the Facebook group, and uh, and then we'll randomly pick one of those people to get the book. In an upcoming episode, we're also going to go over some of the images that I shot in a photo trip I just took out uh, to Southwest U.S. Um, just last week, and I'll be talking with Tim Babasati, who's uh, a guy that went out there with me, and uh, we both were out there for the week, did a lot of shooting around a lot of the national parks. Cool. So we'll be showing a lot of the photos and you know talking a little about what the trip was like. And, then, and further, a further episode, um, we'll interview uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist Rick Loomis, so be sure to tune in. Sounds great.